Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. We're talking about the, the Christian community today. That's right, there's a church called the Christian community. We're not just talking about the wider Christian community, although we're also talking about that. Hey, we've got Reverend Jonah Evans. Uh, we've got Patrick Kennedy on. Uh, we uh, uh, This is kind of a sequel to a, a show that, that we did that I'll link up uh, below uh, with Reverend uh, Evans that was uh, a wider panel about mystical Christianity. And I, mm. I don't know much about the Christian community, and I was uh, so grabbed and entranced by what Re Reverend Evans had to say that I uh, definitely had to do sort of a follow-up show to go go deeper into it. So uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll launch right in with both of you. Uh, again, uh, the, like I was saying last time on the show, like I say a lot of the time, somehow I need a place to start whenever I'm doing these, these very weighty topics, right? <laughs> often very complicated topics, often literally the secrets of the universe. So <laughs> <laughs> if, if you guys can tell me uh, it, as succinctly as possible, what is the Christian community? Mm -hmm. hmm. Succinctly as possible. Yeah, Which I know good. is not, you know, this is not a one sentence I got. Uh, <laughs> right but so the the as possible is important mm -hmm. even so if that takes half an hour that's fine yeah <laughs> yeah exactly right and and of course we don't know uh who wants to go first uh here we didn't we didn't we didn't make any plans beforehand so but thanks first of all thank you john thank you oh, so, yeah. so much thanks, for inviting john. us on yeah, here thanks. yeah um appreciate your your work in this world yeah yeah, well, you know, it is it, it is both a podcast and a YouTube show. So people who are listening, if you you can also watch it on YouTube, and people who uh, only watch on YouTube, you can check it out as a podcast. But if you guys want to rock paper scissors, uh, yeah. you know, people will be able to watch that at home. Well, um, uh, you know what, uh, 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 Patrick, why, why why don't you unleash? Because uh, uh, Jonah had to answer this question already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay all right fair enough so let, let's hear your take on what is the christian I mean, community when you're standing in an elevator and somebody's like what is this thing you're involved with yeah i mean for me it's it is actually the name and that's the most provocative um and general saying as little as nothing also kind of thing to say that who we are called to be uh, is the community of Christians, which is the name for the whole Church of Christ in the world. So the, the, mm. the whole goal is actually to be an expression of the metamorphosis of the original church. Mm. And what exactly it is and what is that metamorphosis? How has it changed? Uh, in the course of its story and why was a total rebirth needed in 1922 when we came into being. That's where we get into the weeds and it gets really interesting and exciting. But I think any other goal than being the body of Christ on the earth, in and with and for humanity and the earth, there is no other uh, thing we are meant to be. Um, yeah. Uh, Jonah, do you have anything to add to that? I, yeah. I think that was a really beautiful way of putting it. Yeah, it's a beautiful way of putting it. Um, the body of Christ on the earth. Um, and I think maybe one of the ways of describing the unique quality of the Christian community is, is that it understands itself as, you could say, like the, the seven sacraments 2 or 3.0. So the, <laughs> whole, the whole picture there is that the human being has evolved. The earth has evolved. Like, for example, there's electrical wires everywhere and there's ethernet everywhere. That wasn't the case when the sacrament that uh, was brought down that is practiced, for example, in the Latin mass. The humanity has evolved. And the other picture there that we work with strongly is that Christ Jesus himself has evolved with us. And so we now need a new form and a new expression of the eternal sacrament to match those two realities. Yeah. And so R Rudolf Steiner was able to, with his capacities, kind of like I mentioned in the last podcast, these Moses capacities to go up the mountain 
and receive the new form and bring it down and give it to Riddlemeyer or Aaron. Yeah. Um, so this, this really also technically is how we understand ourselves, that it's universal Christianity, but it's the most up-to-date form of the sacrament that expresses Christ's reality now in connection with where humanity is at now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another thing that was not there at all in in the in the worldview and spirituality of humanity yet was the very idea of evolution itself. What you just said as a word, you couldn't even have talked about God, human beings, or the earth with the very idea that things are in a story of evolving. It's heresy. So in some <laughs> ways you could say it is a Christianity that can include the mystery of evolving as a way to access God and access our true humanity. Well said. And, and, the, and, and the seven sacraments reveal themselves in our movement within the story of a human biographical evolution, that they are to do with nodal points in the story of a human biography. So yeah, it's just, an, it's just adding to, to what Jonas said. That I think mm. that, that idea of an evolving universe and evolving God and evolving humanity, there had to be a rebirth. Well, there had to be. I, I think part of God's being, Christ's nature, could only come into view once the idea of evolution could enter humanity. Even though many of us Christians have been challenged by the ideas like evolution versus Christianity, I think that's a real sadness it's actually through the lens of the mystery of evolution that you can have a whole new relationship to what it means to be a human and what the universe is and who God is. How did it come to be? And, and can you tell us more about some of the foundational figures? So uh, we've already brought up like Steiner and, and Riddlemeyer, but and I know there's perhaps uh, maybe this is a misconception or a misunderstanding about the Christian community, but, but I think a, a lot of people think it's, it's the Steiner church. Or is right. the, the the Church of Anthroposophy? I can never say that right, but let's pretend that's how you say. That was it. pretty good. Oh, thank you. So, I, th so is that? I mean, maybe it's not a misconception. So, so tell us about some of the foundational figures. Maybe tell us uh, about is this the Steiner Church, uh, and tell us a bit about what they contributed. Why don't you go go ahead, Patrick? First, I mean, I think that's a fair description in some ways because anthroposophy without anthroposophy you don't have the christian community and without rudolf steiner you don't have the christian community so he's absolutely essential and without the people who approached him and who took on the movement and carried it totally separately from the anthroposophical movement and society and from rudolf steiner who had no actual responsibilities within the church whatsoever it's also not thinkable so there's some kind of special uh, relationship here, but it's also an independent one. So it emerged not thanks to Friedrich Riedemeyer, actually, at first. Riedemeyer met up with Anthroposophy and then Rudolf Steiner in 1911 mm. and was one of the most successful Protestant preachers of his age in Germany, Lutheran, got hired to be the lead pastor at the church in Berlin, where he had, you know, 2,000 people showing up for his sermons on a Sunday. And he, that was 1916. By that point, he was a, a deep student of spiritual science, practicing the methodologies also of meditation and concentration and moral development that is provided in the path of knowing for example, in Rudolf Steiner's book, How to Know Higher Worlds, all so that he could better do his job as a pastor of his church. And he really saw that his goal, it never even occurred to him that what we should do is do some kind of new founding of Christianity, per se. But rather, he was opening up direct experiences of the living Christ through his anthroposophical path, and then preaching out of that to two people. So it didn't, he never asked Rudolf Steiner, so does you know Lutheranism have a chance, or does you know is, is it just need to be renewed from the inside? 
it was actually young people who had experiences during the first world war right particularly there was one person named uh johannes van der klein he went into the war like many did during that time like actually like singing songs of joy like here we go to save the world like they were they were there was a kind of collective insanity they actually thought we're gonna have a war that ends wars <laughs> which is already a kind of insanity and the feeling of being together being a kind of brotherhood going to war for something greater than yourself they were inspired by those things having, having ready to sacrifice your life for a greater good by the end of the war, he was completely disillusioned and totally depressed. Like what everyone was basically in an illusion. These were all lies. And the churches chose side and prayed to God for God to choose our side. They also failed. And I mean, like many at that time, if who, who even survived the war, he was at times suicidal. I mean, it was, they saw the the end of the world as it as they knew it and it was in that moment of his life of just deep need existential need that he came across anthroposophy and it just like lit up in him like a like a spark he's like somehow there's a future of the church and it's going to be like a marriage of the deep cultic reality of the catholic tradition and the free spirit of the Protestant tradition through the gift of anthroposophy. Mm -hmm. He just like, he just like saw the vision in his mind's eye and wrote about it in his journal. And that was like 1919. <clears throat> and in 1920, then he had a chance to actually have an individual conversation with Rudolf Steiner. He's very young at this point. He's like 23 or something. And he asked Rudolf Steiner, it's like, is there a future of the church or like is anthroposophy here to replace it? Rudolf Steiner says, oh yeah, this would be very important for the future of humanity if the right forms are found for it. Mm. And Klein goes, oh, I've got to go find the forms. <laughs> so he thinks he's going to have to study ritual history for the next 12 years and somehow come up with the rituals that might work. And he comes up with this huge plan and he tells no single soul about it. So then it's like another young person, another young person. It's these young people burning to somehow find a new way in the world. They approach Rudolf Steiner. They have the question. Mm -hmm. And it's only once another person, Emil Bach, gets involved. Because so, so sorry. Johannes Werner Klein, on the one hand, a woman, Gertrude Spurry, came separately on her own within the same, same time period and ask Rudolf Steiner the basically same question. And Rudolf Steiner goes, have you met this young guy over here from Marburg, Germany? Like, he was actually just asking about it. They, had, they didn't meet. So it was a long time, so they finally ran into each other, and they shared these secret conversations they'd had with Rudolf Steiner, and they go, oh, my God. He said that to you? He said that to me? Wait a second. We were asleep. We got to get a group of people together and ask Rudolf Steiner to come and help us find the forms that will help renew Christianity. So... It was a group of about 18 younger people in June of 1921 with Emil Bach then who really emerged then as the leader of that group who was about 26 to seven at the time. He was in Berlin. He was connected with Riddlemeyer. He started bringing him in. So it was actually a group of young people, also members of the Wanderfuge, these, these like hippies from the, the early 20th century in, in middle Europe. Um, who really wanted to leave this kind of mechanical industrial world of intellectualism at the universities behind and find something real, something living. Um, they they were the ones who who came to Rudolf Steiner and it grew from there. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jonah, do you have anything to, to add to that? That was beautiful. No, that's, yeah, a, a nice little snippet of who else was involved. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's very interesting because that need and, and that that passion and in that that feeling of, of something bigger moving is, is very apparent because I, I think the temptation it would be quite easy right because uh, 
by any standard, uh, uh, Riddlemeyer would have been a, a great success, right? Looking out upon uh, the 2,000 yeah. people, right? Like, uh, and I'm sure many people, particularly uh, us involved with, with some of the smaller churches, yeah. like, oh, wow, you know, that, that is a huge <laughs> spiritual success. I'm, I must be an amazing person and I'm doing so much good <laughs> in the world, right? And then uh, the same thing even for Steiner, right? If someone comes and they say to you, well, the, we can close up the churches. We can just do anthroposophy, right? Like, we can, we can move on. And, and I'm sure the temptation would be very strong for, for Steiner to say, yep, you know, that, that, that's right. We can, uh, we don't need churches anymore. We can just do this, this, this movement that I, that I helped start and nothing else. So uh, I, I think that, that you can really feel that, that, that something, mm -hmm. <laughs> something, something perhaps from the outside is, is breaking in there. Um, uh, Jonah, maybe you can start us off with this, this next question. Uh, how did you both come to the Christian community? What do you personally love about it? And, and how did you discover your, your calling? Uh, to to work in a specific wow. way. Okay, um, wonderful question. Let's see. I was, I the spirit kind of first broke into my life when I uh, had a knee injury in high school, and my father gave me a Tao Te Ching, this Chinese um, mystical philosophy book, and by Lao Tse, and I I read that. 50 times and it just awoke my spiritual striving fast forward through zen buddhism and different forms of kind of eastern philosophy really practicing also the meditation i became let's see i would say dissatisfied i i, I had this experience of coming to a place of consciousness where I was aware of myself in a kind of void, in a kind of emptiness. And my teachers, my Zen teachers were telling me, well, that's what reality is. It's just consciousness in a void. And that didn't satisfy me. And then I met another teacher on the road and he was an anthroposophist. And it was about when I was 19 and he told me, you know, you should look into Steiner and his epistemological works. How do you know reality, basically? And that really woke a new question in me. How do I know what reality is? Is this all there is, this empty void that I'm experiencing as enlightenment in Zen? Because... I had grown up in the Walworth School, in the Steiner School, and in, my mother was an anthroposophist, and I had thought all of that was nonsense because they talked about elemental beings and archangels, and I, I just I had to push away from that. But this route through Zen to this question, what is really knowable? What is really real? How do I really find that? And that Rudolf Steiner had done a lot of work in the thinking realm and in the experiential realm in that area, this teacher that I met helped me bridge my Zen practice with anthroposophy. And that was really important for me to break into this, I, this picture, this impulse that I could find spiritual, the spiritual world myself. I could break into that. And so I began to take up anthroposophy as a spiritual path. And that led me to another experience when I was about 23, where I, I really, um, long story short, I had this encounter with myself as a kind of spiritual experience. Jung would call that the shadow reality of your being. But I actually encountered myself as this sick, um, untransformed beast in a meditative experience that Rudolf Steiner had described in his book, How to Know Higher Worlds, um, as the lower guardian of the threshold. I didn't realize that at the moment, but my mentors helped me. That experience shook me to the core, but out of that, that's why I'm getting there, out of that, out of that kind of disturbing 
soul shattering experience of myself as being so unwell, so beastly. I don't know where it came from, but I had this call to go to the sacrament, to go to the act of consecration, which is our, the name we use for the Eucharist service. And in that experience, I was 23 in the communion experience. And one of the unique aspects of the Christian community is, is the communion part of the sacrament where the priest, and I'm pretty sure this is totally new in the, in the realm of, of the sacramental expressions. The priest comes and comes face to face with each human being there taking communion and places their fingers on the, on the face and says, the peace be with you. And this experience in this moment, I felt through the priest, the presence of, of a being. I didn't have a name for it yet, but I just felt this, this presence. And in this presence, I felt more myself than I, than I did before or outside of that experience. I had this sense that here, there's a being here that's giving me the medicine I need to work with this beastly one that I encountered a few days before in my meditation. So that, I mean, I know that's quite a, a big story, but that literally really is why I started going to church. And I never stopped going to church after that. I felt in the communion medicine for my shadow, for my sinful nature, for my untransformed reality. And I drunk from that every Sunday um, and was nourished. And still I am nourished deeply by the substance and medicine of the sacrament. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. It for wasn't sharing. too much longer till he was at the seminary. <laughs> <laughs> two, yeah. two years, two years through that. But yeah. that, that didn't convince me that I should be a priest or anything. It was just, now I'm a Christian mm -hmm. and I'm dedicated to this and I'm gonna drink from this draft forever. I, you know, I, I think there's a lot there that, that a lot of listeners and watchers are, are, are going to get a lot out of because they've probably encountered something similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also kind of connects my own biography where, where I think spiritual biography, where, where I think sometimes in our culture, right, spirituality always has to be this positive thing and every experience has to be a positive one. And if you're not having a positive mm -hmm. one, then then it's not a spiritual experience. And this, this encounter with the shadow, with the, the lower guardian of the threshold, with the darkness, you know, I honestly believe that this this is a very important step, a uh, mm -hmm. very important uh I mean, maybe maybe I shouldn't say step because uh, maybe not everybody needs to have it or wants to have it or should have it. But uh, it's it's not something to push away or reject. And mm -hmm. uh, in the Gnostic tradition, right, to ascend we must first descend. I think the first mm -hmm. the first thing that puts people on the path to gnosis is actually that this encounter with either the beast within or the beast that is within this world, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this this is what this the, this. And this is not a pleasant encounter, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I, I'm sure people are uh, figuring out. But it's it's not one to be pushed away or rejected, and it's definitely one I think that it's important to understand as spiritual. And, mm -hmm. and I and I think we live in a culture that really doesn't want that. Also, uh, uh, Jonah, when you're talking about uh, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the Christian community does not believe it is the only path to truth, right? Not mm. not only within mm. Christianity, but within the world religions. That that mm. the, the paths are that that all religions are, are an equal path to the truth. Um, that's that, that that's correct? one thing. That's one thing that's actually worth mentioning in a little bit more detail. The, the Christian community has perhaps a very unique way of seeing that, whereas, for example. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the institution of the Church and Christ, Jesus, are equal. So if you don't have the institution, you don't have Christ. 
Um, that's different in the Christian community. We, we have an institution, we have churches, we have sacraments, and we, we definitely understand and experience the living Christ in and through those sacraments. But by no means do we think that's the only way to access the living Christ. Life itself, human biographies themselves, are the, probably the main doorways to experiencing Christ in, in one's own destiny. But there are many ways to encounter Christ as for he is with us in, in the world, in existence. So we, we, we separate those two. But we would say that, well, most, most priests probably would say that, that truth also is a being. That it, this being, so it's not that it's anything, but, but Christ isn't limited, the being of truth isn't limited to an institution also. So there's a nuance there that I think it's both universal and no one is, no one is actually Christ is with everyone, mm. period. But our oh, institution is also unique mm. and it's not everything. Yeah, I, I think um, a lot of people myself included, have had this, this similar journey of, mm. of starting with the wisdom of the East, right? And then mm. something happens where, where it just doesn't quite click or you have an encounter uh, that, uh, you know, uh, perhaps in communion, right? Um, and, and, you, and you orientate towards the Western mystical traditions, which people don't know about. That, that's why we often go to the East. And, and I'm not saying that, that that's wrong or bad. Um, and, and of course, lots of people are going to feel spiritual impulses and end up in meditation communities and Buddhist communities. And it's going to be the right thing for them. But it does seem to be that for whatever reason, our, our backgrounds, our psychology, our interests, our karma, uh, the, the Western path can, can sometimes be be better suited. So I'm kind of hoping that, you know, I, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, uh, perhaps if more people knew about these the, these different forms of, mm -hmm. of the mystical tradition that mm -hmm. perhaps they would be, uh, I don't want to say waste of time, but they, uh, they, they would be encountering something uh, that, that would uh, be a lot better for them a lot faster. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, before we move on to Patrick, sorry, Patrick, I'm just going to say, you know, same no thing where I was, uh, you know, I was studying meditation. I was sitting with different Buddhists. You know, I still meditate uh, the different Buddhist groups, different non-Christian groups, and uh, you know, kind of the same thing. It's it's it, I, I had the encounter with the risen Christ uh, in the Eucharist, um, mm -hmm. and I had always uh, considered myself a Christian, even though I was I had been sort of moving away from it. But that that's what really brought me back. And then with this sort of uh, meditative interest, mystical interest. Oh, okay, well, you know, this, this is I was just communing with Jesus, and He's not going to leave me alone now. So I'm going to need to find something that is going to <laughs> integrate some of these. Uh, 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 these yeah. mystical, contemplative, and and meditative uh, practices, ideas, and philosophies. Okay, enough about me. That's not what the show is about, Patrick. Tell well, us a bit about. Well, hey, wait, wait. Somewhere. That's not fair. I think. <laughs> I think. John, <laughs> I mean, you. Luckily, you said in the show notes. You know, hey, this isn't a Q and A. This is a conversation. So it's yeah. it's nice for us. I think to also get to know you. And when you say you had an encounter with the risen Christ in communion, I wow. think you probably could see our lights light, our eyes light up. I, we're not, I think maybe another way to say it is, are we interested in making sure everyone is a member in our church? No. <laughs> Meaning like our organization? No. No, I'm not. <laughs> Am I interested in people getting to experience what you experienced? Oh, yes. <laughs> may, may that only continue to happen in the multitude ways, however he would wish to enter people's lives, because it's Amen. so... It's so indescribable how much meaning, strength, and comfort comes from just that relationship and mm -hmm. how it gives us things to be able to walk and stand in this world and go through 
things with ourselves and with each other and with this world that do involve darkness and the beasts for which we will benefit of having his presence along the way so anyway i was very touching to hear that that came into your life good yeah no it's uh definitely interesting interesting points of comparison interesting dialogue uh and uh interesting sharing so but uh patrick on leash i want to i want to hear your secrets my, my secrets <laughs> yeah right um yeah i think probably the the first most important experience of my life where this just was imprinted into my whole being. I grew up in, in Sacramento, California, and I was the fourth child. And by that time, my, my parents had found uh, Waldorf education, which also comes from Rudolf Steiner's work, as well as the Christian community. So I was baptized in the Christian community with six weeks, um, grew up in religious instruction confirmed the whole thing and um one of the blessings of my childhood was going to what was called the shepherd's play which is an old medieval uh mystery play from middle europe um the oberufer version of this which is the area where it came from um and it tells the whole story and it, it, it's just you know you meet these shepherds and the shepherds they're presented you know as a bunch you know just a bunch of guys like you're just yucking it up fight get in a fight they're 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 you know making fart jokes they're they're just like they're just one you know, they're not over holy they're just one of the guys but they also are feeling the difficulty and pain of the times, the winter of, of human existence, and they are longing for the Son of David to arrive and to to bring blessing to the meek and the poor and the downcast. And then they have this angelic experience. They go to there's this little place in Bethlehem you need to visit. There's a child born there. It's the child we've been waiting for. And to watch these these big goofy rough guys enter into the stable scene take their hats off and kneel at this cradle and sing a song of awe and reverence actually that's a very very deep impression of what worship and reverence looks like and without pretense but the most powerful scene was the actual birth of the child. It's, Joseph is asleep standing, still holding the staff. The stage is dark. And Mary is there in blue, center of the stage. And Gabriel, the angel, comes up from behind with the star and ho starts holding it up above her. And she starts to lift her arms up and lift her gaze up and and gabriel starts bringing the star down and it's all just music no words and you watch her kind of lifting up and the star coming down to a point where they actually get close and then the star starts going up and you see her hands start coming down and then the next thing she knows you know she's looking at this child and all I can say is like, it was like witnessing something I knew in the deepest parts of my being. This is simultaneously what took place in history and what can happen in my own soul. Mm. Mm. That my own soul can be a Mary. that is fructified but from above mm. and can give birth to a new human being that is born of that union so i was like i don't know four and a half when i first saw 
<laughs> it's like one of my earliest memories. My kindergarten teacher played Mary. She was just like, <laughs> I loved her so much. And um, I don't have a memory of not being aware that the world is full of God. It was just, it was very, very, I found it very strange. I would look at people and they would say like, there is no God. I'm like, are you just saying that to be provocative? Like I, it's like saying there's no air to breathe. Like it just made no sense to me. I took it seriously, but I just didn't, I couldn't find a place of experience where that would possibly be true. And, I, and my confirmation experience in the Christian community was just so profound and beautiful. And, and there you, you have a service, a worship service for children from seven to 14, which is like 15 minutes, 20 minutes long max. It's really beautiful, very simple and to the point. And then you actually have first communion with confirmation at 14. And in that service, then you you hear also said to the community, Christ in you for the first time. Up until then, it's like Christ out, outside of you, in the world, at work in the world, as the teacher of love, in the people you love and admire, it's kind of around you. And this moment uh, at the birth of our own inner lives at 14, now he can appear actually in your own soul, Christ in you. And that I I had I felt it happening, and I was I was confused at first. It really kind of shook me. It was a different kind of shake. It was actually a shaking, like what does it mean that this being is speaking? It seems to be speaking inside me. And what I mean by that is I would be in confirmations with uh, conversations with forty five year olds, parents of my friends, and we'd be talking in the car, and they'd be like, "Yeah, da, 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 this question or that question," and I would say. Yeah, huh, da, 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 da. I would say some thought that was just clear to me in listening. And they would look at me and like, I just learned this. How do you know it? you're 14 years old? <laughs> and I was like, I don't know, because I don't know it because I've lived any kind of length of time. It was like revealed inside me and I got nervous about it. <laughs> and it was the thought that, well, it is that truth that light that is true isn't you it's gifted into you shining into you it is christ in you mm. and i was like oh. <laughs> something came at rest to me that to be able to differentiate between myself mm. and the divine gift of him in me so that's 14. So and it was at that time that I thought for the first time, because I had some amazing priests around me, I thought, you know what, maybe, maybe that's what I want to do with my life. Maybe I want to be a priest too. So I was at the seminary at 24, you know, mm -hmm. 10 years later. Wow. Well, I, I need to uh, break the incredible power of everything that you've just said with a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> so, talk, talking again about the ascending and the descending, and first you have to descend to ascend. So, uh, patreon.com slash Gnostic. We can't do the show without your financial support. You can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can set a cap on that, so you can just give us a buck. Go ahead, give us a buck if you can. Uh, we usually do four to six pieces of media, so you don't do the budget, set that cap. You can also do one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic, and we know that these are difficult, weird, insane, crazy times. And I, I don't think they're going to get better anytime soon unless, you know, JC comes back. I'm waiting. <laughs> and uh, so we understand if you can't help us out with uh, uh, with the demon mammon. But you can uh, tell people about the show. You can just take an episode and send it to someone. That's very powerful. That works really well. Mm. And unfortunately, we, we have these demonic, uh, uh, arconic algorithms. If you like and subscribe and leave comments, all this helps uh, uh, buoyant up, lift up the show. Okay, the, the commercial is over. Uh, the, the next question, which on the sheet, I, I actually did put a note on because in print it sounds a little aggressive, a little aggro. But <laughs> why the Christian community? Like, if somebody wants liberal religion, there's Unitarianism. If they want liberal Christianity with the sacraments, and there's Episcopalianism. So why, you know, why why would I wander into the the, the Christian community Sunday service? Sure. 
Sure. And I'll talk when I have more than one guest because I don't want I don't want to choose, right? And it's like, oh no, no, it's fine. Yeah. Oh no, it's good. It's good. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe I can just start with what comes into my mind right now is um, one of our congregants. Her name is Lily Gobos. She'll probably be embarrassed if she ever watched that, but <laughs> she came off. She's somebody who came off the street into our Toronto con church. And uh, not that she's living on the street, but she just noticed <laughs> that she was driving by. <laughs> and she's, she was a, a kind of, um, uh, she had recently moved to, to Toronto from Tehran and she had been attending the, the, um, the Protestant church down the road, a little bit more of a kind of evan evangelical flavor there. And she just said, after the communion service, she said something. She walked right up to me and she, she looked straight into my eyes and she said, you know, the service that I was going to, they talked a lot about God. And they talked a lot about the Bible. She said, when I experienced standing there and you giving me the peace as the priest, I felt and experienced God in that moment. It wasn't so much talking about, but I encountered and felt God's presence coming close to me. So that maybe is just the beginning of the Christian community service is really a doorway to start to encounter more and more a real communion experience with the reality in his in his current form of Christ Jesus um, and as opposed to what can happen where we get more locked in our intellect or we get thrown into a kind of sensational ecstasy um, ex worship experience where those things are not so clearly found. The Christian community service is a very peaceful, meditative doorway to finding deeper and deeper levels of experience of this being. Some people come in Maybe the mo one of the most common experiences is people come in and they say, you know, I just feel more fully myself or I feel more, I feel really at home in this spiritual milieu. And yeah, that's a start. <laughs> and Patrick, do you have to, anything to add to that? I mean, I think <clears throat> I, I think it's interesting you chose the word like uh, <laughs> liberal um, as some options. What What's beautiful about that word is its root in freedom. Mm. I think that expresses, you could say, a core quality that if if it's lacking, if there is some way in which someone is trying to compel or coerce, threaten mm. me into a certain set of behaviors, <laughs> that just feels wrong. That's a, that is not honoring the dignity of my person. And if Christianity's goal is love then the fact that the church and its history has ever used fear and threats at all is a sin it's just a great sin in our story that the fear of people making other choices um we would try to scare them into love like you know just really we have a we have a hard history i think to to move through 
So, but how can you have a place of worship where the atmosphere is freedom mm. and not have in any way it be flat or, 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 um, what do I want to say? One way to get to freedom is to not at all have any true religious element present. And just like have it be a have it be a cocktail party, just be a gathering, ch chit chat, you know. Like, but if you're gonna go, if you're gonna say, I would like to now offer my entire heart and soul and being to the divine creator, it gets real intense in the room real quick. Um, and I think this signature that this this yeah. age of free individuals. The other threat then is, well, are we all just going to be separate little islands who are, are ourselves, our own churches? <laughs> or is it at all possible to have an experience of community anymore? So this, I, I think it's into this riddle, <laughs> the mm -hmm. riddle of true free individuals and the threat that that does, that that means for a cohesive feeling of community to, to give up neither, <laughs> you would have to be some kind of creative being. <laughs> and that's, I think, the, 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 the stepping in that, that the priest and the church are no longer to be father and mother to you because that would keep you as children and you're immature. But to step into your full authentic freedom as into brothers and sisters with Christ, sons of the Father, and to experience our total individuality and start to experience nevertheless community. I think it's into this challenge that that the metamorphosis of this of the of the church took place. That's that's one of the things that inspires me to no end. Absolute honoring of the free individual, whatever you think or feel or choose to do, and utter true devotional life in community that builds bonds. Be, without having any agreed confession. There, we don't have a shared, like everyone has to believe this or that. It's like, what could hold us together? It turns out the living body and blood of Christ is really powerful for that. <laughs> <laughs> when, when he gathered his 12 in the upper room, he didn't go, and here's the creed. You guys all need to memorize this, and then you'll feel unity. He didn't do that. <laughs> he gave his being. So to give it in a new way, and then it gets into the real details of all of the different ways. How have the seven sacraments changed? There really are incredible, shocking, amazing changes. Like a baptism for, for actually for children, for the first time in Christian history. It's not for adults. It's a, the, the, the baptism for, that is used for children is usually the adult baptism used on babies who can't talk, <laughs> who can't confess Christ. <clears throat> Those are truly unique. Uh, Rosicrucian. Three substance baptism that this is mind blowing in, in its uniqueness, or a children's service actually developmentally shaped for seven to fourteen year olds, um, and on and on it goes it goes on and on. Real unbelievable transformations in all of the seven sacraments. But why? That's where I go back to. Well, it's something to do with. The way in which the community is described in the service as the congregation that knows Christ, gnosis, knows Christ in freedom as its helping guide. Yeah. And, and Patrick, you actually went into to my next question, which is about the sacraments, which of course we've we've talked about uh, that you folks and I've brought up almost almost every every question in this interview. Um, why, like, why the sacraments? And we've kind of already covered that. But why the sacraments? And in the, in the Christian community's opinion, and I know you said that you're low dogma, but are are, are they are they symbols or are they they literal mm. real miracles? And can you tell us what sacraments you practice? And the, and I know Patrick, you started telling us a bit about it, but how are, how are they different from from apostolic church 
uh, uh, sacraments, right? I, like so you mentioned, free baptisms and a baptism for for children, uh, which other churches don't have, or uh, isn't usually thought of as the the seven sac- uh, the seven traditional high church sacraments, which are done the the in the West, uh, you know, the same way uh, uh, across traditions. So yeah, if you could kind of tease this this out uh, uh, for us. That's exciting. It's so fun to finally talk with somebody who wants to talk about the details of the sacraments, isn't it, Jonah? <laughs> yeah, well, really, I'll just do the brief part, which is to say we we have the traditional seven that was established roughly around Aquinas, I think, in terms of finally codifying, okay, there are seven, and then there are these other rituals, but there are seven sacraments. So moving through the human biography, baptism, um, anytime before 14, before confirmation, birth to 14, but ideally around birth. Um, Confirmation at 13, 14, within the 14th year of the person. And then we have the sacrament of confession, which we call the sacrament of consultation in in the English speaking world, sacrament of consultation. The sacrament of the Eucharist, um, sacrament of marriage, sacrament of ordination of priests, and the sacrament of anointing, which is very much a sacrament for dying, not uh, um, the sacrament of healing anointing, per se, though people do recover when they sometimes when they receive an anointing, but it is very much connected with the threshold of death. So from the gate of birth to the gate of death, encompassing these nodal points of life with the sun within the seven planets, you could say, being the sacrament of the Eucharist. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jonas, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it just, it also connects to the, the previous question, like what what is the Christian community and why is it unique in the milieu of the other expressions? Um, and in the Christian community, the sacraments, as Patrick described, relating to the also the human biography as kind of medicinal um, Christ substance blessings for each stage of our of our life. Um, they're, they're central to the Christian community because uh, how Rudolf Steiner described it to the first priests, the sacraments as rituals are actually the only real religious doorway to finding the real substance of Christ's being. We, we can't just, so if we just remain like Riddlemeyer was, a Protestant, Protestant, we we have the danger of just remaining in our intellect. The sacrament is actually a doorway into the real substance, objective substance of Christ being that can bless and uh, actualize blessing in one's heart and life. One of the challenges, though, is that when you have a sacramental tradition, very often we see that, I mean, the Catholic Church is easy to pick on, but we see that tendency in the Catholic Church where if you have really strong forms like the sacraments and really strong pictures of revelation, it has a tendency to calcify and become dogmatic and become very authoritative where you have to believe this or else you're wrong. So we have the sacraments because they're the doorways to actual substance and reality of Christ's being. But we try to balance that out then with the gifts of Protestantism, where there's this culture, like Patrick also mentioned beautifully, this culture of freedom in our thinking. The prob- Another problem with that, like sometimes we can see in the unita- more Unitarian movements, is there's a freedom there, but it becomes a free for all. And Christ and Jesus and the mysteries of his actual being start to get lost. And like Patrick said, it becomes kind of just, 
your truth is my truth and we're all just kind of trying to be human together. The depth gets lost. The true life-changing reality of Christ's being gets lost. And it becomes more and more, and we see that more and more now, for lack of a better word, a more new age movement where actually you become God and you become the author of your destiny and you're trying to manifest everything. Um, so there's these dangers, you could call them two sides where you can get too authoritative and stuck with, but yet have this depth and tradition and um, on the other side, this strong danger that we see more and more in our time, which is everything is just an intellectual argument, or you start to think you're the author and God of the universe in the more new age expressions. And the Christian community kind of teases out both of those strengths, so the freedom, like Patrick said, and the depth and the sacraments as the doorway to actual experience of Christ Jesus himself. Uh-oh. I think we lost the host. <laughs> <laughs> well, he'll be back soon. I guess I could continue the interview because it's still recording, it looks like. Yeah, Patrick, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, what I love is that you, um, oh, there he is. There he is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Just for whatever reason, Steve. Very... No worries. We were about to carry okay. on. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was going to just continue asking, you know, questions. <laughs> well, please, I, I was... Easy, easy to edit around. So, <laughs> but well, well, anyway, what, just... Patrick? What, what, just to finish that thought, you know, the Christian community, why the sacraments? Because in their, real up-to-date living form, they provide both the objectivity and the depth of the reality of Christ Jesus, but also if held in the right way, allow us to freely live in and with them and question and think and cultivate the true spirit of freedom that is actually totally appropriate and real in Christianity and Christ being. Yeah. I think uh, he answered your question without using the lingo. I don't know if you heard that, Jonathan, to say, for, I mean, it is important to say we have no office of teaching. Yeah. We, we have no official Christian community dogmas. We have utter freedom in our teaching. We just, the one, lo the one law we are to follow as priests is don't teach something different than you pray. It's a it seems basic, right? It, it's kind of obvious. Like if you're going to go pray these rituals, don't teach something different than what you're saying when you're praying. So as long as that's not happening, then you're in integrity still. So there's nobody else monitoring what we're saying today, or that we're somehow like uh, whether or not it's um, the official truth. And yet right. you will find a shocking similarity to what we teach. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, I think for me, part of that would be none of us would be involved in the movement if we didn't feel that the sacraments were miraculous. Mm. That is to say, a deed that is taking place in this world through which forces from a greater world are breaking in. Real, like, like sun rays from the sun. Mm. Like like wind from the clouds, like rain, real forces that wouldn't have been there without them. So this, this, this idea that, and, but you have to recover a new and truer maybe understanding of what is, what is a miracle or, or how does goodness come into a world of cause and effect? And from the beginning of our founding, that was a, the immediate question that we were confronted with. You're going to have to answer that question because that's why Christianity will completely lose its value because that is the nature of the incarnation. If nothing but this world, as it currently is constituted with matter and atoms and cause and effect, is, is possible. If you can't begin to think anything else besides 
a random break-in by supernatural powers, then you won't have true Christianity. You need to wrestle with the mystery of how does how does goodness happen in a mechanically running world? Yeah, and and I think particularly, and obviously there there's because the Christian community and Steiner and all these great thinkers are related to the wider mystical Christian tradition. Like what you just said is is Gnosticism. That's how I would define Gnosticism, Patrick. If I was like, mm, first, God, that's way, exciting. A succinct way to do it in two sentences. So actually, maybe I'll steal that. Uh, <laughs> <next> <laughs> and ask me, what is this Gnosticism thing that you're into? Well, you know, in in a mechanical world of good and evil, <laughs> or in a, sorry, in a mechanical world of cause and effect. Um, okay, uh, uh, moving on. So say a par parishioner comes to, to, to one of you two or to both of you. Uh, same parishioner, I don't know. <laughs> so separate, separate, separate coming to. <laughs> the ghost so, talk to Jonah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they 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 come to Jonah. Jonah. They come to you and and, and they say, you know, I I, I really love coming to, to church. Um, I, I get a lot out of it, but I, I want to become closer to God. Like, what what can I do outside of taking communion and celebrating the sacraments with you? Like, what what can I do to get to get closer to God? Should I yeah. should I be reading the Bible? Should I be reading Steiner? Should I be meditating? Should I be praying? What what do I do? Help me out here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 many options, and 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 some of those folks that would think that we're just the Steiner Church or the Anthroposophical Church, maybe think we just do Steiner meditations or read Steiner lectures all the time, which some people do. We definitely cultivate the love and honor and devotion to human freedom. That is so signature in our movement. However. You asked me if they came to me as a priest, I, the, the only and main practice that I recommend constantly, because also we're just such beginners at it, and I include myself in that, is real, authentic prayer that is not based on... Um, the idea that I'm just trying to ask for what would make me more comfortable, but, but trying to learn to pray out of the spirit of what you just said was, would be how you would define Gnosticism, which is how can the moral reality of the universe break in to the cause and effect uh, realm of tribulation that I find my heart in. And, and that, that way of prayer, um, where I can actually lift my heart and my mind like a chalice and receive forces of gratitude, strength, courage, love, hope, in concrete, very specific, real places in my life where, where it's needed, that is possible. That is real. It happens. It can happen. I do it. And that I've experienced as a priest and pastor is the most helpful tool to deepen my life along the religious way of Christ and Christianity. Um, so, so that's that's what I would do. Okay, okay, and and Patrick, I'm I'm a seminarian, <laughs> and I want to be closer mm -hmm. to God. So I come to you. What 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 should I be doing? What do I need to be doing? What would you advise that I do in in my off hours? Well, to, that's to, to that's an interesting Lord. choice by by saying seminarian because if I'm a, if I'm a pastor in a church and someone comes to me. I mean, I think this is connected to this question. Is there some kind of agreed upon set of spiritual disciplines that we hand out or teach or give for the individual path? There, I would just say simply, simply put, there is none. There is no agreed upon thing. You could say our life and communal prayer is also the path for us the sacrament of consultation is then the instruction from my perspective 
and this is what's so powerful. It's such a changed sacrament. Mm. It, this, this knowing Christ and freedom as our helping guide that I mentioned before is kind of the signature way to describe this recognition of in Jesus Christ, I find someone who can lead me on the path. The ultimate, the teacher of the teachers of human history. There is one at whose feet all teachers truly sit, if he is the very being of truth itself. So I, as a human being on the path of my own biography and life, we consider every one of us in school. <laughs> that your whole, every, everything that's happening in your life and in your lives, in multiple lifetimes, is a part of our school. And he is the one who is shaping the great school of life. <laughs> He doesn't need to establish a special school in the Gospels because he is the he is the teacher and the school. So when we come to the sacrament of uh, consultation, with uh, you could say, while you're struggling with the math problem of your life, <laughs> how, what? How do I break through with this particular equation? <laughs> this person, this struggle, or even just trying to figure out what is my calling or I can bring all that is truly in my heart to him. And that sacrament begins with the word learn. I, I would, you know, you're more familiar with the, the various apostolic um, offshoots uh, of the sacramental traditions. I, I don't know of a sacrament in the universe that begins with the word learn. I don't know either. Yeah. It, it, it just, it's a very shocking, striking thing. Learn. Learn to do two things, to offer something and to receive something. And what is given there in the instruction in this holy intimate conversation between the ordained priest, the person who comes, and the third who is there spiritually. He, the words of the sacrament come as a response to what you say and provide this path that leads to peace and the inpouring of the love of God into your heart so that you can love in the world. So all of the work for me would be then, whether the seminarian or the congregant, is to walk with them as a brother, sister, to aid them in their unique work to offer and receive as instructed in that sacrament. It's the discipleship sacrament for me. It's, it's where in our movement, the path emerges in an individual way where a single person comes, where you receive instruction, literally in the form of learn, it says that learn, and that the activities given open up and can express themselves in many, many, many ways, most especially for us in prayer. Yeah. Um I know for Steiner, uh, Rosicrucianism and, and the figure of, of Christian Rosenkreuz were, were very important. And, uh, and actually, Rosicrucianism is very uh, important for me personally. It's something that we have uh, done a number of shows on. Is, is Rosicrucianism reflected in any way in the Christian community? And are other Western esoteric traditions and practices uh, reflected uh, in the Christian community? Mm. Well, maybe I can start there. Um, one place where one could find a kind of signature of Rosicrucianism, and when I when I say Rosicrucianism, I mean the gesture of starting with what is experiential and universal to all human beings, starting with a tree, starting with a rock, starting with 
what is here on the horizontal plane and working with that in such a way to ascend from there into the spirit. Um, that's distinct. Maybe one could distinguish that from the more sacramental way where we're working first to just open ourselves to grace from above down. So, and one of the ways if, if that's taken as what Rosicrucianism is, one of the ways that expresses itself in, or that, that impulse expresses itself in our Christian community is in, in the sermon, actually. We have a homily that is usually between five and 15 minutes long, placed similarly as you would find it in the Catholic Mass, in the Gospel section of the, of the Eucharist. Um, and very often, well, our, we can say this because Patrick and I are seminary directors, we, we train our priests to have this gesture in how they do sermons. So they, we start with something that is experiential, sometimes a nature picture, sometimes something of an experience that many people have had. And from there, we try to work with it in such a way that it becomes gradually a window that reveals the spirit, that reveals Christ Jesus, that reveals what streams out from Golgotha. So that gesture is archetypally a Rosicrucian one to start with something universal, earthly, horizontal and work up, so to speak, into the spirit. And that's very much, as opposed to the sacrament itself that starts with, let's worthily connect ourselves to Christ Jesus right now. So what's in the spirit as a grace right now, as opposed to working our way through the sense world to the spirit. So there's a little, in the sermon, there's a little Rosicrucian uh, gift, so to speak. Yeah, it's a, it's a deep part of the sources of things, even if just to say what, I mean, what did we, what, all that was accomplished in the course of Rudolf Steiner's service to humanity is, of course, just jaw-droppingly stunning. But one of the things that he recovered was the trichotomy of the human being. Really deep, deep, deep research to recover the human being as body, soul, and spirit. And go down into the very deep physiology of head, heart, and hands, actually right into the temple building of the human being the way in which our lung and heart system work, our head sense nervous system, our digestive system and limbs, all revealing once you delve deeply into them, mysteries connected to the soul and thinking, feeling and willing. And then again, the mysteries of the Trinity and then the nine hierarchies. Like to be able to reconnect the deepest dust to the highest eternity and to be able to think that through and and re, re, reunite them actually in our whole world view that is that that is a fruit of rosicrucianism and so a whole new orientation to the trinity which emerges now in how we cross ourselves we don't say just the same verbs for each the prayer to the father the son and the spirit but that each actual divinity has a different verb. Yeah. So we say the Father God be in us, yeah. this level of being. The Son God create in us, the whole mystery of creation. The Spirit God enlighten us. Yeah. And this touches into in really beautiful ways the rosicrucian formula of being born of the father mm. dying in christ 
and being reborn through the Holy Spirit. Mm, beautiful. The Rosicrucians understood the Trinity as a process. That's radical, That's but that's apocalyptic. The apocalypse of God who was, who is, and is coming, this mystery of the Trinity in time. The present moment, the past, and the future, that's an expression of the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. That, that's that's Rosicrucianism, pure. And when you get to our baptism, now we're just like, <laughs> we're just deep in it because we now have a Christian baptism for mm -hmm. children that I mentioned, but that uses three different substances for the baptism. So you're still baptized into the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But that is then connected up to the soul forces, thinking, feeling, willing, as well as three earthly substances that uniquely express the nature of the three as processes. This is where it gets super pagan, super like, this is where the churches go, yeah, yeah, you mentioned the Trinity, but this is getting weird for us, where it's just the water. And we say, well, water was just John. <laughs> we want to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And we want to unite physical, soul, and spiritual, and bring them into healing and whole relationship to one another. So we use water, salt, and ash, and there the ancient alchemical traditions are revealed in the uh, mercury, salt, and phosphor, uh, or sulfur tradition. The, these mysteries, that there are three substances, but not just substances, three processes, three processes, that's really key. Three processes which are themselves a certain expression of how how the Father is working, how the Son is working, and how the Spirit is working. Uh, that we are built out of those realities, and that's not just spirit soul, that's also substantial. And baptism is about a soul coming from heaven and uniting with a physical body. So we need to get all these things linked up and to receive them them well. So that's a little couple breaststrokes from from my side uh, uh, how, how Rosicrucianism comes in. Oh, perfect! And that perfect. ought to get us in some heret heretical territory real quick. Oh, yeah. Whoever thought we might we might be Christian in the traditional sense, now we've left. We were a scary scary group now. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is it is unfortunately time to wrap up. Although I, you know I'd love to go deeper into some of these uh, topics and some of the stuff that you've been bringing up, but uh, you guys probably have lives and things you got to do. So <laughs> uh, give us your plugs. I have been flashing them up on the screen for people uh, watching YouTube at home, and also they will be in the show notes for people listening as a podcast or if you're on YouTube. And oh wait, I, I don't want to type all that out. You can go down and just click it. But tell us these links. Tell us what these links are. Tell us where people can find out more about the Christian community and what you uh, two indi uh, individuals individually do uh, and all that good stuff. Mm. <laughs> what? Are you hesitant, Jonah? Or <laughs> I'm not used to plugging. Yeah, well, I would just say if you're interested in, yeah, the living Christ, as he expresses himself today. If you're interested in, in deepening yourself and experiences like Deacon John has had, experiences like are possible um, at the altar. Yeah, check out our website, check out our, our Patreon. There's a dynamic conversation that Patrick and I have every week about the depth of Christianity and its relevance today. And yeah, I mean, I don't, out. I know I look forward to those conversations. Me too. <laughs> I'm always finding I'm coming deeper into things. So yeah, the last, the last series we did was on the question of what divides us. And that was a very, very rich thing. Um, yeah, so check it out. Yeah, uh, you know, conversation as, as a spiritual practice, conversation mm -hmm. as a way of, of getting to the truth is... I don't know. It, it 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 seems counterintuitive because I feel like we're inundated with with podcasts and YouTube shows, mm. but it's 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 something that is not given the philosophical and spiritual weight that uh, that that mm. I think it deserves. So, uh, amen. Really happy. 
well yeah, really happy that you folks are, are doing are doing that work and uh yeah and uh for me for for final plugs uh we were talking about meditation uh i teach meditation on the side uh mm -hmm. secular meditation and the mindfulness uh, traditions to keep myself sharp and to give back i do uh weekly sit mile end meditation.substack.com at 11 a.m montreal time uh, if you're around montreal <laughs> as well that's that's all online so come on out mile end meditation.substack.com also if you are in the montreal area uh my apostolic and i church gnostic parish is holy grail substack.com we generally try to meet every two weeks we're having some venue stuff lately but check it out if you are around and venue stuff also means that we're doing more stuff online so go to holygrail.substack.com and even if you're not in montreal you might be able to check it out okay thanks so much for listening watching goodbye everybody thank you john thank you jonathan <laughs>